been another difficult week for uh, the <laughs> Prime Minister. It feels like we're saying that every week at the minute. Uh, it looks almost impossible for the government to get its Brexit deal through. Labour haven't committed to calling a confidence motion in the government, so will the SNP? Uh, we think Labour should table a confidence motion and I said last week if it does so the SNP will support that. Uh, I think it is possible that a confidence motion right now could succeed. This is a government that is weak and unstable and becoming more weak and unstable with every day that passes. But even if it didn't pass and succeed at the first time of asking, there is another merit in having a confidence motion called just now because it would help clarify Labour's position. You know, Labour's position right now is that it won't back a second EU referendum until it has tried and failed to trigger a general election. But if it won't try to trigger a general election, then we're in this catch-22 position. And it seems to me right now that Labour is as much a barrier to making progress on Brexit as the Tories are. So we think there should be a confidence motion and we'll continue to talk to other opposition parties. Uh, there should also be uh, the bringing of the vote on the Prime Minister's deal this week. The Prime Minister simply can't be allowed to just play for time and run the clock down. We don't have time to waste anymore. So we need clarity, we need things to move on. And frankly, it's time for a new approach. This is a pretense by the Prime Minister that her deal somehow can be salvaged and we'll get some last minute miraculous change of heart by the European Union. It's not going to happen. And the more time that's wasted right now, uh, the worse for everybody potentially. So if you think there should be a conference motion, why doesn't the SNP call one? Well, we will continue to consider that as an option, but as you probably know, uh, the SNP could table a motion, but the only party that is guaranteed to have that motion called for debate in the House of Commons and to have a vote on it is the official opposition party. But so you can table it makes. We can table a motion and we may well do that, but we want to do more than just have a gesture around this. We actually want to bring this to a vote. And therefore, it seems to me that Labour doing it is the best and in fact the only guaranteed way of doing that and of course it stands to reason I mean this is a pretty obvious point I'm about to make that without the support of the official opposition party then clearly that's not going to succeed so let me be very clear the SNP will keep all options open and if Labour won't act then we are prepared to act but it's Labour that can bring a, a motion that is guaranteed to be debated and voted on. And I'm, I'm sure most people would agree that that's the more sensible way to proceed. And if it doesn't succeed, and I don't think uh, we should assume it won't succeed, given uh, the incompetence of this government, then at least it gets Labour into a position where they can take a decision on whether or not they back a second EU referendum. Because it seems increasingly obvious to me that that's the best way and perhaps the only way of making progress and resolving this whole sorry mess. OK, well, let's talk about the idea of a second referendum, because there is lots of uh, chatter about the possibility of a second vote uh, in Westminster at the minute, with reports that some of Theresa May's allies are sort of secretly preparing for one. Um, would the SNP support it? I'm guessing that you would. And what should be on the ballot paper? Well, Remain should be on the ballot paper. I mean, I, I've read reports in the last few days that Theresa May might or she might be forced by colleagues into a position where we should, she would propose a referendum with her deal or no deal on the ballot paper. I mean, I think most people would take the view that democratically that wouldn't be an acceptable choice. Uh, I, I think there should be a second referendum that give people across the UK the opportunity to decide, given everything that we now know uh, after the last two and a half years, to remain in the EU. And to answer your initial question, yes, the SNP would support that. If uh, there was to be a second referendum, would there need to be some kind of safeguard in place uh, to dictate what happens if Scotland, as it did last time, voted in a different way to other parts of the, of the UK? The SNP would propose that, as we did the last time. Uh, we put forward uh, the proposal the last time that the UK could only leave the EU if all four nations of the UK voted for that. And that would have been a recognition that the UK is not a unitary state, it's a, a relationship of four nations and you know, if we cast our mind back to the Scottish independence referendum, we were told that it was a relationship of equals. So the SNP would certainly make those proposals. But you know, whatever the constitutional future of Scotland uh, is, and as you know, I hope and expect that will be as an independent 
country. But it makes sense for Scotland to have the whole of the UK uh, within the European Union. So the most important thing, I think, now, given the mess uh, that has been created over the last two and a half years, is that people all over the UK get the opportunity to change their mind. And in a democracy, surely people have the right to change their mind. Well, let's uh, talk about that uh, ability to change their mind. If there was a second referendum on Brexit, do you think that there would have to be a second referendum on Scottish independence as well? Well, look, there is a difference between the Brexit vote and the Scottish independence vote. And, you know, I, for that reason, I don't think we're necessarily talking precedence here. If you cast your mind back to 2014, uh, there was a very detailed prospectus that told people what they would be voting for if they voted yes to independence. The white paper on independence, 800 plus pages of it, set out uh, all of the details, set out some of the compromises and trade-offs that would be required. Of course, not everybody agreed with that, but nobody can deny that detail was there. That is in stark contrast to what happened um, in terms of the Brexit vote, where we had that slogan, or uh, to be uh, much blunter about it, that lie on the side of a bus. People didn't know what they were voting for. And now we have the situation where uh, people are trying to interpret what the Brexit vote meant. You know, Theresa May says, oh, it was a, a vote to curb immigration, or it was a vote for an independent trade policy. Frankly, uh, there's no clarity on that whatsoever. Um, on the question of should there be another vote on Scottish independence now, uh, I'll set out my further views on that in the new year once we get over uh, this uh, period of turmoil around Brexit. But the whole Brexit process over the last two and a half years has strengthened the case for Scottish independence immeasurably, in my view, not just because our vote in 2016 was ignored, not just because Scotland's voice has been cast aside over these past couple of years, but if you look, you look at the position of Ireland, an independent member of the European Union being shown support and solidarity by its colleagues in the EU, contrast that with devolved Scotland, completely cast aside, our interests ignored. And, you know, last week, watching all of these small independent members of the EU having more say over what happens to the future of the UK and Scotland right now than Scotland does, I think helps to make the case for being in charge of our own destiny as a country. OK, I mean, I think that some people who support Brexit would probably dispute the idea that um, people didn't know what they were voting for uh, at that referendum. But the other thing that I'm quite keen to ask you about as well uh, is why is it that you're you know, obviously a supporter for uh, Scottish independence, you, you're unhappy with uh, Scotland being dictated to by Westminster, but you're happy to be a member of the EU, you're keen to be a member of the single market and the kind of rule taking that that involves. So why is it different by you know, the relationship with Brussels and that of Westminster? Well, I, I think that is, frankly, with, with the greatest respect, a really overly simplistic argument. The European Union is an organisation made up of independent countries. Nobody argues that France or Germany or Ireland are not independent countries. They come together pulling sovereignty to help deal with uh, and tackle some of the big challenges that no country can do alone in the modern world. Climate change, for example, through the EU, the world's biggest single trading uh, market has been created. And, you know, you only have to look at Ireland just now. Ireland's not being dictated to. Ireland, in many ways, is calling the shots in the EU. So the power of small independent countries in the EU is there for all to see right now. Um, and as I said a moment ago, that is in sharp contrast to the position of Scotland within the UK, where our interests are being cast aside, our voice has been ignored, we face being taken out of the EU and the single market against our will. Now, an independent Scotland will always have the closest of relationships with the other nations of the United Kingdom. That much is self-evident. But I think the case right now uh, becomes all the more stronger for Scotland to also have that close relationship with our colleagues across the EU, um, to be that internationalist, outward-looking country that continues to play a part in the world and doesn't have its interests completely cast aside in the way that's happening at the moment.